deficit of democracy. It's generated by AI. On a framework to regulate artificial intelligence. Is AI a blessing or a curse? Will the global south's economic rise bring more global sway? And how will different visions of democracy impact global governance? Hello and welcome to this special program on democracy Join our special and debate, governance. Democracy and Governance, only on CGTN. Hello and welcome to this special program on democracy and governance. Democracy is a universal aspiration. But upon the end of the Cold War, there came a call from the international community to follow the Western model of democracy, which it regarded as universal, eternal, and the only path for governance. The world, however, is fast changing, and so is the meaning and implementation of democracy, which now faces enormous challenges and even uncertainties, ranging from regional conflicts to generative artificial intelligence. Join us in this special program are Victor Gao Jikai, Chair Professor at Suzhou University, Martin Jack, author of When China Rules the World, The End of the Western World and the Birth of a New Global Order, Zun Ahmad Khan, Research Fellow with Center for China and Globalization, Chandra Nair, Founder and CEO of Global Institute for Tomorrow, and Christine Suzanne Jin, Director of Jitala Institute Indonesia. Welcome to Dialogue. Well, in the past couple of years, you know, we have seen uh, the rise of uh, regional conflicts, uh, as we know, the ongoing ones in Ukraine and Gaza. At the same time, we also see this Western governments, you know, take sides with Ukraine and to a certain extent Israel. How much does this Western mainstream media and social media follow this bias? And Chandran, I will start with you. Uh, I know you have been following the global media landscape. Uh, what's your observation? Well, in short, my observation is uh, you know, the same as yours. But I'd like to just point out that we should not be surprised at all um, that the, the Western media takes sides in historically. And the difference in opinions being expressed by other parts of media from other parts of the world is also to be expected. We have a very different history. So the Western media's biases, of course, entrenched in its history of supporting the expansion of Western ideas, values, and even uh, uh, territories. Uh, what is important, I think, for us to understand now is move beyond a critique of Western media, because I think that's already been done to death. What we should be looking at really is what's the new media going to look like and how the imbalance is going to be uh, corrected by media from other parts of the world, and hopefully which can be balanced. And I, I have great hope that some of that will arise from this part of the world, the Middle East, etc. We have this latest, of course, as an example of uh, the dramatic difference, let's say, in the media coverage from the Global South and also the Western media here. Uh, let's hear what Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim's remarks about the Gaza situation uh, in his visit to Germany. You cannot find a solution by, by, by getting so um, uh, one-sided in terms of looking only at one particular issue and erase 60 years of atrocities. The solution is not just releasing the hostages. I agree with these hostages, but that's not the solution. We are a, a small player. I, I don't have this excellent uh, relations with, with Hamas, but I do. And I have told the Chancellor, yes, yes, I did express my concern that those just must be released. But then, can you say, is that all, full stop, period? What about the settlements? What about the behavior of the settlers now, continues daily? What about the dispossession, their land, their rights, their dignity, their men, their women, their children? Are these of no concern? Where have we thrown our humanity? Why this hypocrisy? Christian, uh, you are from Indonesia. I believe you are following the situation in Gaza closely too. Uh, what do you make of the uh, remarks by uh, Prime Minister from Malaysia here? I reflect a lot of the concerns that we share in Indonesia as well. The human part of it that is so, so contrasting with the way the media has been reporting the situations, and I think a lot of it, the root of these differences have been um, affected by 
history and also by sociocultural experiences. I mean, we can see geographical proximity affecting how the region and developing countries in, in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, relating with Ukraine and also with the uh, Palestinian and Israel. These kind of like uh, sociocultural experiences are so different, but definitely not highlighted by the Western mainstream media. And because they are so preoccupied with their own agenda in pushing some of the narratives, it's very much different for us in, this, in the region. And this definitely also, um, the information that we got in Indonesia, um, a lot of it also come from um, some of the activities that we actually have. Uh, Indo Indonesia has opened an Indonesian hospital in the north part of Gaza since 2011. And it's been built by donations from Indonesian people, Indonesian Red Cross, and some of the other religious organizations. And now the hospital has been turned into IDF military base. And this is something that is unacceptable. Our government has expressed their strongest uh, protest for this. And this kind of experiences um, luckily for us, we have this kind of access from the people uh, uh, that are working in Gaza, but we cannot have that kind of information from the Western mainstream media, unfortunately. Martin, I will turn to you here. What do you think uh, is the root cause of this uh, you know, lack of a fair coverage uh, in terms of the global media scene here? Now, I have to say that, you know, Israel has been given a pass in terms of Western public opinion, public opinion by own country, uh, it could do no wrong because uh, the, uh, Europe is uh, immersed in guilt uh, about the Holocaust and Israel as a result can do no wrong. But actually what's happened in Britain is uh, much more complicated. Uh, sure, the media, has been uh, very much pro-Israel. But the public mood is very different. If you look at the opinion polls, very large majorities uh, against uh, uh, calling for a ceasefire. Globally, the situation on both of these issues has been extremely revealing because basically the global south has either been neutral or not gone along with the story on the Ukraine. Um, and, that, and that is one of the major factors which is undermining the Western effort, in my view, on Ukraine. And as far as Gaza is concerned, then the Global South, you know, has said goodbye, actually, to the Western position, in my view. It's overwhelmingly pro-Palestinian. Uh, pro um, so, so, I think this is this actually presents, in globally speaking, a, a quite new kind of situation, um, uh, and uh, suggests something that is definitely a drift, a drift, in terms of Western influence. It just doesn't carry the same weight that it used to be. Above all, in the developing world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Victor, uh, obviously, I mean, a lack of a fair coverage or objective coverage, uh, you know, is not. Uh, uh, can, can see uh, I mean, conducive to this resolve, uh, resolving this crisis in Ukraine or G Gaza. It is not even you know, helping the Western world, you know, in the sense they are being isolated from the absolute majority in the global south. Uh, but why it is still happening, either the government's policy, the attitudes, and also the, the, the media? Well, first of all, uh, I like what Western countries claim. Western media in reporting about Gaza crisis as well as the Ukrainian war, not only failed to bring a level of objectivity and realism to what's really going on in Gaza and in Ukraine, they seem to demonstrate an over-eagerness to uh, twist the situation in the direction that serves the Western countries. For example, in the case of the Gaza crisis, everyone knows more than 25,000 civilians were killed, and 75% uh, of them were women and children. Many of them were pregnant women, and there, was, there were cases that the soldiers from the Israeli side actually targeted pregnant women and shoot, claiming one bullet killed two. And 
these are really on the verge of atrocities and uh, uh, it's really against not only international law but also human conscience. So why the Western media is not doing its job in reporting the realities and bring the cruelties on the ground to uh, everyone in the Western country and in the world at large. Now, in the case of the Ukrainian war, I think the Western media failed in two respects at least. One is that they do not talk about the need for ceasefire and the need to bring the war to an end as quickly as possible to save the lives of the Ukrainian people. Secondly, they didn't even talk about what reason gave rise to the war when it broke out on February in uh, 2022. And they kind of depicted the situation in Ukraine as if there was a big bang. And before the big bang, when the Russian troops went into Ukraine, there was nothing. And fortunately, in the case of Gaza, social media is very active. And despite of the blackout by the Western media in general, many people in many parts of the world can still get real glimpses of the cruelty and the atrocities being committed against the civilian people in Gaza. It is time to call to an immediate end to such cruelties. Mm -hmm. Well, speak of social media, uh, Zoom, U.S. native uh, uh, duty uh, soldier, Aaron Bushnell, you know, who set himself on fire in protest of the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. policy on Gaza or support to Israel. Uh, so heavy censoring, you know, this is the word that used, uh, used to be used by the Western media, criticizing media in other countries, in particular in the global south. What's, what's going on here? Well, I think, I mean, um, I agree with, I mean, a lot of what the previous panelists have said. It isn't a surprise that the mainstream Western media has biases. The difference today is that we're able to talk about it more openly because, as you mentioned, the social media access of people across the world has increased. The awareness, you know, the issues that people on the ground, uh, be it in Palestine or other parts of developing countries, uh, their own voices can be heard in a much better way than before. And that said, I mean, you mentioned uh, a few social media. I know that many of the voices, pro-Palestinian voices, people on the ground in the war zones, uh, they have been blocked or banned because of something that was remotely offensive to uh, the elites who have captured the media space in the West. Uh, that said, I mean, I, I'm not sure what what comments we can uh, make about why it's being done. It's true that uh, that media in the West is owned by certain families. They have their own economic business interests. Uh, the media in the West is not only not reflecting the interests of their own people or the people in the global south or developing countries. It has never. But it's also uh, not able to be receptive enough. And they've created an echo chamber which is becoming smaller and smaller. We see multiple protests. I mean, especially um, as Victor Gao just talked about, you know, the, the divergence, the difference in the coverage between the Ukraine and the Palestinian, uh, these, these two conflicts. Uh, we see that uh, even though mainstream Western media is trying to uh, minimize the access of people, people do have access. And you see multiple thousands, millions of people across Western countries as well protesting against what's happening here. So I think uh, the, the biggest risk that Western media is facing right now in the medium term or the short term, in fact, is that it might just become irrelevant. Uh, we know that maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even though the way certain wars, certain conflicts, and as I would say, I mean, conflicts in the part of the world that I'm from or the conflicts in Muslim countries in the first uh, 20 years of the last of this century, um, they, the conflicts, the people, their suffering was not reflected. And at that time, social media was still not that active for us to be able to, for the world to be able to see what was really happening on the ground. But a majority of the people from developing countries and the people who make a, a, a vast and increasing uh, percentage of the migrated communities in these Western countries understand this bias. They understand that their suffering uh, their perspectives are not only being ignored, they're being uh, made uh, to be sound, uh, to, to sound incorrect or immoral. Mm. Uh, well, Chandran, obviously we are living in a changing world, a rapidly changing one. You talked about uh, you are uh, writing a book, actually, uh, that deals with uh, topics uh, like this. You see uh, there's a lack of, uh, let's say, representation, the voice from the Global South. What needs to be done probably to have a fair 
let's say, uh, balance of voices uh, you know, being represented in the global, uh, global scene here, reality. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, just for one second, can I say uh, on the record, can we stop using the word the global South? I rather call it the global majority. Or I call it the global non-aligned majority. <laughs> yeah. Right. So let's 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 keep that one from now on because it has. And anyone's interested can go to my LinkedIn and I posted that today. But uh, to your the discussion we're having here, something that um, again I've written in the book, the chapter I'm writing for this book, I emphasize something that's really ignored, and I've I've written quite a bit about it recently, is why are these things happening? Why are the people that we thought were good journalists. I have friends who work for some of the largest, most powerful uh, institutions. Why are they all silent privately? They all got the memo, as I say, keep silent or your job's on the line. So the question is, who runs these institutions? So like any any other businesses, like in a large companies, everyone's an employee and you have the tyranny of the, the hierarchy of the corporation. So the tyranny of the global media, the Western media now, needs to include the tyranny of the military industrial complex. This is a much larger topic I won't go into here, but we have to understand. One just needs to tune in to CNN, for instance, to see how repeatedly they trot out retired generals. They don't have anyone who's talking about peace. The whole military industrial complex, and this is no more conspiracy theory, has essentially um, you know, captured the, the powers of government. And therefore, through that, it has affiliations with industry throughout, tech companies particularly. And through that, uh, uh, the advertising uh, that is essential for the media companies to survive, the media the media is essentially captive to that. So you've got to understand too that the, the wars that we're seeing, the continuous wars, is also a reflection of the growing power, the insidious nature of the military industrial complex. The point of the Voice of America when I was a kid in Southeast Asia was to tell me that the Vietnamese were bad people, to tell me that the Chinese and nasty commies are coming down, the domino theories, all the things we lived through in Southeast Asia, the struggles in Indonesia. That was the, the message. We believed it because we had just come through a decolonization period. We were subservient. The only books we read was those of us who were educated in English, etc., were the books written by Western scholars. Today, there's a whole different traction uh, uh, in terms of what the information is. And I think what's really important too to understand is that uh, we need, I, I come back to us, uh, uh, the, the, this part of the world, Africa, et cetera, to create new narratives so that people understand the history, the shift, and therefore we don't keep uh, pandering to the power of the Western media and almost complaining about it all the time. We need to create alternatives. I'm not interested in the Western media anymore. I'm interested in what are we doing to inform people in our parts of the world. I agree with a lot of what the panelists have said, um, is the way in which actually um, the Western media is co increasingly coming unstuck. And I think that the reason it's coming unstuck is because of a profound shift in taking that's taking place in the world, and that we often we talk, of course, about the rise of China, but actually the most important single post 1945 development was the was decolonization and the development that, that, and what was happening in the developing world, where which is home to the vast majority of humanity. Uh, and I think that this period, I mean, even maybe particularly last year, partly to do with uh, Gaza and so on, this is reaching a new kind of maturity, a new kind of fr fruition, actually. So that um, the developing, I mean, you know, in the, living in the West, basically, the attitude is still a sort of colonial mentality or a post-colonial mentality, which is, well, the developing world doesn't really matter. I mean, whenever they use the phrase international community, quite frankly, it only refers to the West. It never refers to anyone. It doesn't include China, for, for sure. It doesn't really include India. And, you know, that kind of map of the world is com coming completely unstuck because the developed world now accounts for only one third of global GDP. I mean, you know, 
the, where the world is happening, where the change is happening, where the growth is happening, is across the developing world. Of course, China has a special role to play in this because it's, you know, the, it is part of the developing world and it is the leader, in a sense, of the developing world. But I think this completely and utterly uh, deconstructs um, the, the Western narrative about its place in the world because it is becoming increasingly less influential. You have seen a deficit of democracy. It's generated by AI. On a framework to regulate artificial intelligence. Is AI a blessing or a curse? Will the global south's economic rise bring more global sway? And how will different visions of democracy impact global governance? Hello and welcome to this special program on democracy Join our special and debate, governance. Democracy and Governance, only on CGTN. Let's shift to another very important element uh, for democracy. Although AI was already ubiquitous, the recent arrival of generative AI, such as ChatGPT, has ushered in a new era of possibilities as well as risks. Uh, there has already been much debate over the possible impact of AI on democracy. Opinions are quite divided. Some say AI and democracy will help fix the other, while others believe AI will hijack democracy. So let's start with some comments uh, we collected uh, online. Uh, one named Lindsay Gorman says, uh, we can't throw our hands up and live with confused uh, information environment that's bad for democracy and we are creating our own problem humans are living on this planet for years humans have done a great job without ai for limited benefits we are taking big risks we need to think rationally for humanity not just for our pockets another one uh, by miguel antonio saying that is ai really a threat to democracy but is this serious cause for concern or just the latest round in the moral panic about misinformation? Uh, Christian, I want uh, you, know, you to give us your opinion about you know, what's the, the relationship of AI, the new technology? Is it a threat or is it um, you know, sometimes probably uh, something that helps democracy? I think AI can both be a blessing and also can be a curse. In many instances, the development of high-tech uh, digital technology has so far been helpful in increasing the efficiency of public services uh, and also improving public services for uh, uh, overall people. And I think AI has that potential as well to elevate uh, public services for the people, of course, if done correctly and if governed correctly. But of course, the curses can be uh, manifold as well. There are privacy concerns about how AI, uh, the large amount of data that's been absorbed by AI going to be misused. And we see the, the almost comical example of Google's uh, Gemini image, uh, AI image creator, how human bias uh, are included into the image generation when they ask to make the image of the founding fathers of, of United States, for example, they all came up with people of colors, when in reality, you know, no, none of the, uh, uh, of, uh, well, like the founding fathers, the prominent ones are not people of color. So this is just one example of how AI can actually be curse, uh, a curse for uh, the democratic governance overall. First of all, AI is a profound revolution. It is taking place right now as we speak, and it will last for many years and decades in the future. Whether someone is afraid of AI revolution is irrelevant, irrelevant because AI re revolution will keep its own course and completely change the world we understand. Secondly, I think there is a danger that in dealing with AI, there may be confrontation or rivalry conflict involved uh, between uh, governments in particular. And this will create possibilities for a very dangerous scenario. That is, AI may be used in geopolitical rivalry among and between states, leading towards a showdown very much dominated by AI. Further, if AI keeps developing in such 
great speed and permeate into everything that we homo sapiens, sapiens do uh, in our life, in our family, in our society, in our corporates, governments, for example, eventually there is a danger that AI may eventually subjugate human beings to be a second-class species. I'm an engineer by training, so I've got nothing against technology. But about 10 years ago, Mo, I wrote a, I wrote a piece uh, suggesting that the internet was probably the most dangerous thing that human beings ever invented. And I think, uh, despite all of us uh, drawing from the benefits, uh, I think when historians look back, and particularly what just Victor Victor just said, um, you know, the balance will look very negative in terms of what it has done to our societies. Uh, I often say things that people don't like to hear, but today the average the ten year old child, even in Indonesia, can watch pornography. Uh, wait till what AI does with all of this stuff. So in my view, uh, what Christine said about the benefits all there, the efficiency, we all know that. But let's face it, the, the value of the technology and why the valuations are so great is because they essentially, you know, in, in the highest level, increase productivity. And what does increasing productivity mean? Displacing human beings. So one of the things I think we have, we have a moment is, uh, just like we look back uh, 100 years later after, after the steam engine, and the human ability to use fossil fuels. And we say, oh my God, we need to decarbonize. And we have all these existential threats. And as Victor said, but well, we don't have a hundred years to learn the lesson. My view is that AI has a lot of potential to do certain things, but my God, it has to be regulated so strongly. It cannot be left at the way it is. And I don't think we have 15 years, we have five years. In the pick up on what uh, both you and uh, Victor mentioned about the international, uh, let's say, competition, uh, let's use this word. Uh, uh, Zuan, I want your opinion on this. You know, a U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, uh, who introduced the AI legislation uh, in uh, 2003, uh, said in a speech that if we don't uh, program these algorithms to align with our values. They could be used to undermine our democratic foundations. The Chinese Communist Party could leap ahead of us and set the rules of the game for AI. Democracy could enter an era of a steep decline. So we are seeing, you know, uh, let's say Washington's inclination probably to monopolize or weaponize uh, this technology here. Hmm. We, we are seeing a misdiagnosis. I think those values or the perception of how well those va values work for their own societies or are relevant for the rest of the world are being questioned already. I mean, that said, um, I think the fact that the United States is trying to weaponize something that, in fact, the world should be cooperating on. We are, once again, you know, post-1945, uh, other panelists have already discussed, we are in a different world, a world where more representation, more meaningful representation is required. And what that also means is that we must firstly acknowledge that the trends we are currently experiencing are irreversible. And that means we need to have consensus. You know, we need to have consensus between countries, international level consensus that is inclusive on how exactly are we going to impose ethical boundaries on the further you know development of artificial intelligence i'll also mention briefly i mean of course we think about uh, you know how di different technological advancements uh, over the centuries not just decades um, did increase human capacity how maybe in some material ways, many more people are better off, but there were always negative implications of those advancements. Even for example, you know, when, when I started university, we weren't allowed to even look at our phones in class. And now, I mean, the, having mobile phones is a basic necessity. We cannot imagine life without it. We talk about the internet and social media, the negative consequences of how these, uh, you know, uh, these uh, uh, these are being utilized and what kind of impact they're having on people. But we cannot imagine a life without it. We also know the multiple benefits, including that we are much more aware of various opinions that were simply not accessible to us 20, 30 years ago. That said, I think artificial intelligence will have the same. I am not an engineer by training at all. What I do imagine is that what the United States is currently proposing could um, at best, you know, for them lead to a, a policy where they are being isolated from how artificial intelligence and this inevitable progress, this inevitable 
uh, transition is going to uh, play out. And uh, on the contrary, what they should do is think about how we, as one global community, as countries across the world, knowing that we cannot simply ban, ban human capacities potential. If you start um, banning uh, technologies, or if you start uh, imagining that perhaps uh, isolating China in some way is even possible, that is, uh, that is simply, um, you know, that's imagination that doesn't work in today's world. In the 21st century, in this century where China is a major part of the multipolar world, rather than accusing China of potential malice, what the United States must be doing, which would be less tone deaf, is to think of mechanisms that we can have more global cooperation, understanding, dialogue, consensus, some basic values on which artificial intelligence and the role it is going to play in the future um, can be agreed upon. We have another uh, question here, actually, from the internet user. You know, how uh, should we approach this uh, governance of artificial intelligence models and tools to steward their potential public benefits uh, again? You know, people, some people are insisting on seeking the benefits from AI. Uh, Christian, and mm -hmm. of course, as we said, you know, some other pan panelists are, you know, looking at probably more about the dangers, the risks, uh, you know, uh, embedded with uh, the use of artificial intelligence. So, you know, what do you make of that? I very much agree in terms of there should be some sort of like regulation or system of governance that is, um, compiled together by the countries that are, um, you know, sharing the interest and also the, you know, the, the, the view of how this kind of like AI government should be developed. I think the example of what uh, has been done is with the ASEAN or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. For example, the ASEAN Guide on AI Governance and Ethics that pretty much uh, serves as a practical guide for the organizations in the region, there are some contrasting interests happening, and I think by now um, the South, uh, the the global non-aligned uh, uh, community have agreed that we're not going to follow this path of war, and we're just going to push for peace and peace and also prosperity development for the region. And this is. Um, the joint effort in the region for this kind of like AI governance that therefore is highly crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I want to hear quote uh, this, uh, you know, uh, the, the Chinese uh, permanent representative to the UN, uh, Mr. Zhang Jun, Ambassador Zhang Jun. He proposed at a UN security conference, uh, you know, meeting uh, last year uh, that, you know, five principles must be adhered to uh, when it comes to the principle uh, for guiding AI governance, uh, putting ethics first adhere to safety and controllability, fairness and inclusiveness, openness and cooperativeness, and a commitment to peaceful utilization. He said the problems generated by the AI showed the importance, necessity, and urgency of building a community with a shared future for mankind. Basically, everybody, you know, we are in the same boat. Well, first of all, I think uh, uh, Ambassador Zhang of China, the United Nations Security Council, mentioned uh, very good points. Uh, he sounds more like a philosopher and a sage, for example, rather than someone very much in the depth of the AI revolution, because those practitioners are really pushing the frontier of AI on a daily basis into the future. And no one can pause and look down into the future because you do not know what eventually you will be staring at. Now, you also mentioned uh, Senator Schumer. I think what Senator Schumer mentioned is surely a way to weaponize AI. They want to embed AI with the American values versus, for example, African values or Latino values, etc. That's not the right way of doing AI revolution because you are talking about weaponizing AI and using AI as an instrument to not only sow discord between and among nations and cultures and civilizations, but eventually AI may develop its own intelligence separate from human intelligence, and they may eventually decide that if humans are so much divided and if humans are being divided into opposing blocks, maybe they want to set up their own block which is above mankind. Therefore, history may look back at what Senator Schumer said as how short-sighted you are, because you really do not know what AI is really all about. 
and you underestimate the almightiness of AI, and you actually play the role in human beings being subjugated by AI. There need to be a very coherent, meaningful, profound level of cooperation mm -hmm. to make sure that AI does not run the mark and get out of control and human beings will not be subjugated into a second class species or even 8 billion mankind will be eventually significantly reduced to, like some people in the West say, about 1 billion. Who gets to be reduced and who gets to survive? Who makes that decision, for example? Mm -hmm. It only is going to be decided by mankind as a whole on an international basis rather than by one person, one country. And I will seriously doubt that we will trust Senator Schumer to make that decision. His decision, if ever made, will ruin mankind, will ruin Homo sapien as a whole. Therefore, let's talk about international cooperation in a meaningful way about developing the frontier of mm -hmm. AI revolution. Well, uh, Martin, you know, raising your hand. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I have this sense of urgency, obviously, from what uh, Victor has talked about. Uh, and also, uh, Chan Duan is uh, going to respond to that. Uh, Martin, you want to start? What I wanted to say were well, two things, really. First is, I'm very, look, the cat is out of the bag. That is clear. We can't put the cat back in the bag. AI is going to happen. And that's the reality of the situation. Um, I must say I'm more cautious about this than I generally would have been about technology in the past. And the reason is that its implications could be very profound. And I agree with Victor, could be controlled, could be under the worst conditions, uncontrollable. So I don't think this is, you know, I don't give this development a... Uh, 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 you know, a, a, a hundred percent blessing in my view. I think this is going to pose some extremely tough questions uh, for uh, humanity. And actually, you've only got to just look at the impact of the internet, actually, and what's happened. And the shift in power in the United States, in the West, certainly, that has taken place from uh, governance, uh, Co properly constituted governance, elected bodies, towards the power of technology and techno technology companies. And they have come, the West, the American technology companies have come to exercise huge influence, actually, in all sorts of different ways, not just politics. I mean, that is, it's not so much the politics, it's the cultural impact. It's the impact of, on people's identities and how they're constituted. It's the impact on the nature of uh, upbringing and children and their position of children, the rights of children. Those have gone absolutely you know, out of the window. Where's the regulation in the United States on techno technology companies? It's almost zero, frankly. I mean, there are two areas of control in relationship to te 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 technology companies. One is Europe. Yeah, they're very active, the EU, on seeking controls on technology companies. Much, They're well ahead of the United States. The problem is there aren't any European technology companies. So that leaves the question of China. And China has taken very seriously the question of controls of technology companies. And they need to go further, in my view. No, this cannot be, this cannot be a, an independent estate. It's just a very quick thing. I, I, you know, when we talk about AI, I like to introduce the concept of BI and CI. BI being basic intelligence and CI being common intelligence. And one of the things, because I'm going to keep this short, but it's just people to, I think, connect the dots. We all talk about AI. We get captured by the fascination of this, all of this. But post-COVID, we really need a world in which we understand that we don't live in a digital world. We live in a biological world. If COVID wasn't a reminder to human beings and policymakers, particularly in the global majority countries, that biology is key. And by that, I mean, just take the part of the world I come from, ASEAN, uh, 700, 700 million people, possibly a billion, 20% of that population is sewered, right? So you can see what I mean. Technology is toilets too. 
So I always say toilets before fiber optics and satellites. Uh, our, and if AI can be uh, leveraged to build toilets and clean waterless toilets, I'm all for it. That's the future. Thank <laughs> you. Right. We're witnessing a deficit of democracy. It's generated by AI. On a framework to regulate artificial intelligence. Is AI a blessing or a curse? Will the Global South's economic rise bring more global sway? And how will different visions of democracy impact global governance? Hello and welcome to this special program on democracy Join our special and debate, governance. Democracy and Governance, only on CGTN. In the last part of our special program, uh, we are exploring the fundamental question, you know, back to the, the topic, you know, what constitutes good democracy and good governance. Um, of course, you know, upon the ending of the Second World War, you know, the international community, there's a call of uh, basically, adopt, uh, I would say, uh, adoption or adaptation or acceptance of the, the Western style uh, democracy, which is seen as universal. Uh, so, Zun, I w have this question for you. Is it a universal? Should the, every country follow uh, the Western model of democracy? Well, the, the quick answer is I, I don't think so. Um, I think Firstly, you know, post-1945, a lot of countries um, fought for their freedoms, fought to, uh, you know, become independent from their colonizers. And at that time, you know, whatever system, whether they had any form of election or they didn't, um, they already had a political system that was quite close to what the colonizer had introduced. And many of them just transitioned into that. It became uh, quite normal for countries to start uh, trying in whatever way possible based on their own structures and institutions they had to replicate what seemed familiar and uh, doable. That said, um, I think one of the extraordinary things we have seen with China's remarkable rise is that um, countries have learned that the system, whatever system of governance they follow, is not meant to be a replication of the Western democratic system, which hasn't worked in addressing real challenges. Like Chandra just mentioned, I mean, the real challenges are hunger, um, lack of access to water, poverty, inequality, um, education. There are such real challenges that this system of governance, whether you have those key institutions, whether you have regular elections, those systems have not been able to address those issues. And then you have China with a unique system um, and increasingly, you know, we are uh, we are seeing uh, ways in which the Chinese system is being understood, whether it is through the Belt and Road Initiative or other mechanisms that people across the world, especially I will not say global south, but the developing world, continents of the world that have faced um, uh, centuries of challenges, they are collaborating and trying to understand what go good governance looks like. So uh, long story short, I think um, de democracy essentially, if we go back to the origin of the term, it is an idea that has existed in multiple parts of the world, in multiple languages, that a system of governance that is for the betterment of people, that is responding to the needs of the people. So uh, definitely we need to be uh, more result oriented, which is something that the Chinese system has exhibited. We need to recognize our unique challenges, our unique circumstances, and we need to think about, of course, in a centralized way, what are our core priorities as a country? Uh, well, related to that, uh, in 2023, the Academy of uh, Contemporary China and World Studies uh, they conducted a survey, uh, you know, in 23 countries across five continents, uh, focusing on the modern development uh, here in China. Uh, the results showed uh, that uh, about 96% of respondents uh, endorsed the idea that the countries should choose the path to democracy and modernization that uh, probably best suits uh, to their national conditions. Uh, you know, meanwhile, uh, the global satisfaction with Democracy Report, published by the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge, I think that's done in 2020 actually, showed that people in more than 100 countries and regions are dissatisfied with Western democracy. Uh, for example, the US has seen dramatic and unexpected decline in satisfaction. Uh, so Martin, I want to have you, uh, you know, weigh in here. What do these results show? Well, I think that, um there is a deep uh, disillusionment in, the, in Western countries regarding their political systems. Um, they, they, 
<coughs> it's not being expressed in terms of alternative forms, but rather a kind of alienation really uh, is taking place. What's the reason for this? I think it's absolutely cheek by jowl with the decline of the West. You know, if you look at the, the economic performance of Western countries over the past 30 years, um, and especially since the financial crisis in 2008, I mean, basically, you know, they're barely growing. Living standards are, are stuck. I mean, the, the living standards in Britain now uh, are the same as they were in 2008. The real wages are the same as in 2008. So it's a completely static situation and people are, are becoming disillusioned in this. At the same time, it's coupled with very poor governance. So I think that what we're, what we're, what, what we're seeing is uh, the actually quite rapid decline of support for and belief in the Western style of democracy. And the core, of course, at the heart of this problem now for the West is what's happening in the United States. Because, you know, who would have thought 10 years ago that there would have been a seri serious questions asked about the survival of American democracy? But that is exactly what is happening now. There's a deep disillusionment in America. You, and, you know, it, it seems to me that we can ask two questions now, which we would not have asked quite until quite recently. One, uh, will democracy as it's been known in America survive? I think we've got to, that's a big question and I'm not so sure what the answer is, but I suspect that this era of that, that kind of democracy is coming to an end. Not immediately, but over time. And secondly, will America survive in its present uh, form? In other words, the, 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 the various states of America, will they remain with it? I don't think that should, it also should be taken for granted. There was an interesting poll recently, which was taken in America of, uh, uh, of this question. So you've got this crumbling of Western style democracy. On the other hand, you have something quite inter very interesting happening in the rest of the world. Now, I think that uh, the, uh, the, new, the newly liberated countries, by and large, never had a choice in what their governance. Say in the British example, because they had lots of so many colonies, they were, they were forced to have some version of parliamentary democracy like Westminster and so on. And that kind of democracy was never their democracy. It was a democracy that was imposed by the colonial powers uh, uh, on them. Now, of course, these countries have grown up, acquired, uh, you know, developed their cultures, developed their education. They, they, they are in the process, and this is a long process, of exploring what they are, what their identities are, what their values are, exploring the continuity with their history, which mm -hmm. was, had been denied by colonialism. This is a very complicated but very rich process of development. And so I think in these countries, we're going to see something really interesting. Well, Victor, here's a question for you, of course. You know, people often uh, talk about this, I, I believe. You know, uh, the, you know, China calls itself as an uh, all process, you know, people's democracy, which stresses very much about this uh, sense of a pragmatism, you know, efficiency, or whether uh, it solves a problem, whether it pushes for development. Uh, well, the U.S., it stresses very much, uh, you know, this a uh, lot of noise, you know, campaigning, national campaigning, a lot of debate there uh, on the form. Uh, or procedures. Uh, so how do you compare these two style of democracy, two kind of a system here? Thank you very much. You are raising a very important question. First of all, I think democracy is a virtue and uh, without democracy there will be more, there will be no modernization. Secondly, if any country or group of country or West as a whole believe that they can dictate democracy to other countries, and they have the perfect form of democracy, that in itself is anti-democracy. And that itself will not prevail because democracy, a very important part of democracy is to treat others as an equal. So the United States and West as a whole need to treat all the other countries as an equal, rather than imposing your version of the truth onto other countries. Now, from the Chinese perspective, 
whatever political system we have works for the Chinese people. That's the most important thing. Our system may not work for the American people or the British people, but that's not the point. Our point is to make sure that whatever political system we have in China, or as we call consultative democracy, or whole process democracy, or people's democracy, whatever the name we put onto it, work for China, solving the Chinese challenges and the problems. If the United States wants to impose its version of the truth on to China, no, we will not accept it. And if China wants to impose our version of the truth on the American people, I will be the first one to rise up and oppose that. It is much better if we follow the principle, your God for you and my Buddha for me. Don't impose your God on me and I will not impose my Buddha on you. That will be greater democracy. That will be a better system for both China and the United States and all the other countries in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, well, speak up for the national conditions or, you know, different systems. Uh, uh, Christine, uh, share with us, uh, do you see there are some unique characteristics of uh, Indonesia democracy and the development there? Actually, Indonesian democratization process has been a learning process that comes from within and also from learning uh, from other countries, including United States and China. Um, we already have some shared values between China and Indonesia in this uh, process of democratization. One is consultative process. I think I have to give it to China in the sense that um, with the examples of how China formulate their first civil code, um, how it took four years and tens of thousands of experts doing research and doing policy recommendation, I think that's a very good uh, uh, lesson to learn from China. And of course, like no political system in the world is perfect, like not even America as the "Quote unquote beacon of democracy," but we can still learn from what uh, from America's lesson as well. And I think this goodwill uh, to learn from other countries' experiences with an open mind is also one of the reasons why Indonesia has been hosting the Bali Democracy Forum since 2008. There's the idea is that a progressive democratic architecture in the region will require a joint effort by countries in the region, including China. And I think the most recent Bali Democracy Forum, China brought 2,200 participants. So this enthusiastic participation is very much admired by people in Indonesia, and they are all involved in rigorous dialogues. And also uh, the participants has a contribution in establishing the uh, Global Think Tank Network for Democracy Studies, you know, where we can continue to exchange these experiences and gain from lesson, uh, best lessons and best practices. Well, of course, you know, if you look at, if you take a closer look at the debate here, and, I mean, this is really about the, the standards or the measures uh, uh, we use it to judge uh, the governance, to judge the democracy. Chandran, what are the standards you think there are probably to measure uh, you know, a country's performance, you know, governance, the, the democracy or whatever are there? I try and not uh, get bogged down in the discussion of whether one country is more democratic or one is an authoritarian state or a communist state, because this is all sort of the, the language of the Cold War, you know. And I'm more interested, therefore, in the question you just posed. What is the measure? What do we want out of a system of governance? And so I'll put it in the context that perhaps uh, quite often is forgotten. Uh, we're going to be a, a planet with about 8 billion people. The most populated part of the region is going to be Asia with about 6 billion people. Yet all the evidence is that we are going to be confronted with profound existential threats from climate to biodiversity loss, to water scarcity, to food, uh, to food security, and uh, the, the, the plundering of the oceans and all of that. These are sometimes just sort of chuck aside, uh, set aside, and then we start talking about AI and governance and all of this. So what is the governance system of a large country like Indonesia got to do? Indonesia's population will be, you know, give or take 400 million in the, in the next 30 years. That's a large country. Pakistan would be 350, something like that. So what do you want a, po a, a political system in Pakistan or Indonesia to do? I will keep it rather simple. To provide a way to organize a society so that economic activity can take place in a way that ensures the, 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 the self-sufficiency of that that's ecosystem, but more importantly, therefore, ensures 
that the large majority of people do not suffer from the drudgery of life. Most people don't understand this. Drudgery of life includes, dare I say, having access to toilets, water supply. So the things that I think a governance system should be, whether you want to call it democracy or authoritarian or whatever, is it has to deliver on first the challenges of the existential threats that we face, food safe and secure, that's a major challenge coming up. Second, water and sanitation. I've already given you the numbers. Most people forget that 80% of the world's wastewater is not treated. Third, basic housing. The amount of uh, people without proper housing is growing around the world and in a world in which the climate, uh, climate impacts and extreme weather. So then, uh, healthcare, education, and of course, most importantly, meaningful work, which AI is trying to make sure there isn't much of. That's what we want a governance system for. Call it whatever you want. But as was said uh, uh, earlier, it's about outcomes. And I'm very happy to live in a country where there's a strong authority but delivers on those for the majority so that we live in a world in which the social context, the social protections are in place. Call it what you want. So again, I would urge us to move away from whether it's democratic or whatever. The question is the context in which you have to solve problems and the institutions of the state have to deliver on those. And I just mentioned what I think are the six priorities, given the evidence of the existential threats we face, particularly in the large developing countries of the world. The first and foremost thing is to understand that no one system, um, as it stands today, or as it, any system that stood 10 years ago, 20 years ago, will be effective in addressing the evolving challenges and needs of the country, also given how the international situation is. Uh, changing. New challenges, new uh, issues emerge and one needs to be receptive. And I was uh, just recently, you know, having uh, having a discussion on the recent Pakistani election and um, how it's, it's interesting it happened during the two sessions, the very important political meeting that China just had. And um, it's important for people in Pakistan or other parts of the world to understand what the two sessions really is. It's, it's an annual meeting, which is about not only involving you know, the NPC members, but also members of the CPPCC, professionals uh, on a cross-section of society identifying what can be further improved. So a yearly meeting to understand what has worked and what can be improved. And I think that receptivity is what can make a system better at governing and addressing challenges. The second issue that developing countries have faced is they have been looking at the quality of their institutions, um, the, the kind of representation within their parliaments or the or in, increasing the quota of women, et cetera, et cetera. They have been looking at institutions as if replicating those institutions, ideal institutions will somehow result in being a better democracy. Uh, and you have these studies uh, from think tanks in many Western countries trying to rate the quality of democracy based on this standard. But the real standard has to be, again, to what extent are we able to address the real challenges of people. And a, a country like Pakistan, you know, we stand at 40% poverty right now. There's so much that developing countries need to think about, which is which will require decisiveness, receptivity, and studying the ground realities. We need to have a better understanding of what our resources are, and we need to observe each other and think what is a better system that is solving our problem. So I think the answer ultimately to your question is there is no one perfect system. The idea that a system can be perfect is the biggest problem that the world has faced in this rat race towards a democratic ideal. And the real solution is Think about how and how effectively, efficiently are you able to address existing challenges and improve people's quality of lives. Well, thank you, Zun. Uh, and many thanks to all of our guests uh, joining the special discussion on democracy and governance. With that, we come to the end of this special program on democracy and the governance. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qingdo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.